The series finale, written by co-creators Brian Koppelman and David Levian, delivered the anticipated suspenseful hour complete with a super complex plot, a Steve Miller band soundtrack, and plenty of double, triple, and quadruple crossings. However, Admiral's Fund also wrapped up billions with a healthy helping of decency, compassion, and gas hugs. This episode is best described as satisfying, which it is as far as I'm aware, an all too rare feat for any series final. I say this because while the villain gets his comeuppance and Mike Prince isn't just destroyed, he's humiliated. We get indeed have a classic happy ending. However, the two main protagonists, Chuck and Axe, simultaneously pretend to be happy with their life, but in actuality, they have only reset their settings. Chuck and Axe are essentially going back to what they were doing before Billions started, whereas Wendy and Taylor showed growth by pursuing new career paths and even giving hints that they won't stay at Axe Global for long. Despite his declarations of independence at the beginning of the season, Axe is currently the head of his own hedge fund, with a large number of the same finance pros at his disposal to carry out his wishes. Meanwhile, Chuck is eager to continue his role as the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, balancing social justice with financial concerns, and so it changes. However, I thought this episode was good because it followed the traditional, let's get the bad guy approach. The season's central theme, celebrate your friendships because you never know when you'll need those friends to help defeat your enemies, was proven true during this rare instance of almost everyone cooperating for the greater good after seven seasons of self-centered, mercenary acts. Apparently, billions of people believe that humanity still has hope. Admiral's Fund confirms my concerns regarding Philip Sharon and Kate Sacker, who have been covertly working with Team Axe Chuck since episodes 6 and 7, respectively, right away in the show's opening sequence and obligatory flashbacks. Everyone in the Billions universe is celebrating today because, as Prince approaches Camp David, our tenacious Rebel Alliance is launching a plot of embarrassment and misery that is incredibly entertaining to see. Team Axe Chuck gets to work in the two hours that pass between Bradford Luke, Prince and Scooter giving their phones to the military police at Camp David and receiving them back. First, Chuck tells the SDNY employees that six of the biggest U.S. natural gas corporations have been working with Russia, China and Iran to collude and manipulate prices, and that SDNY is conducting a thorough investigation into these claims. However, nobody should reveal this information to the media since Chuck will take a very serious stance against them. Thanks to Winston, Taylor manages to break into Michael Prince Capital's risk management algorithm and reprogram it to Zabe when it's supposed to zag. After that, Philip just does as his employer says, deploying all of the funds and letting the algorithm take care of itself. Despite the fact that Aries Spiros considers the high concentration in the natural gas industry to be a little weird. You would never guess it. The financial press is hyping this news barely 20 minutes after Chuck made his big Chuck Rhodesian speech about not leaking the story concerning energy infrastructure misbehavior. The stock market has been rocked by accusations that natural gas corporations were conspiring with adversaries of the United States and MPC's holdings are falling. As Zen Philip mumbles false promises about how the algorithm would self-correct, Victor and Dollar Bill get terrified. In a charming interlude that serves as a confirmation of Kate Sacker's political aspirations, Chuck promises to assist her in her quest for congressional office during the quiet period before the storm. All Kate has to do is go back to SDNY and give up the cotcher gowns. But hey, Chuck swears this time not to micromanage. As if it wasn't heartwarming enough, Kate also learns the value of friendship. She chose to be a friend rather than turn Brian Connerty into an enemy by following the advice of her former colleague. Connerty received financial assistance from Chuck and Kate's backing to get his legal license reissued seven years ahead of schedule. However, don't expect him to leave his hibachi position just yet. However, we still have some unfinished savage, so there's no time for a lengthy old-school billionaire's reunion. All hell breaks loose when Prince & Co. receive their phones back. MPC's portfolio holdings are completely depleted and have been liquidated. Prince has been locked out of his own account, thus this is definitely not a hack. It's time to leave the president alone and return to New York. We witness additional heartfelt farewells as the tension rises between Chuck and Dave Maher, the latter of whom is also involved in the Mike Prince takedown, and Wendy and Taylor. The SEC was prevented from allowing Prince or Scooter to halt or reverse any of the trades that MPC made that day thanks in large part to the efforts of the Attorney General of New York State. However, there isn't a scene that could be more enjoyable than watching Michael Thomas Aquinas Prince 
get brutally destroyed in front of an open-plan office. Unbranded, we play back Lex Luthor's Trump-like outburst from the season opener as he storms back to the MPC offices, a scene that, given some perspective, makes far more sense than it did 11 episodes prior. Wendy, however, responds exquisitely, giving Prince the reprimand man he deserved 45 years before. Yes, we're just warming up. Axe, Taylor, Kate, Wags, and the whole MPC team not only saw Prince lose it, but so did Governor Nancy Dunlop, Q. Nelson Muntz chuckle. Prince pitifully tries to minimize the damage, but it's obvious from the governor's obvious amicability for Axe that my predictions from last week were accurate. Yes, she had always been a part of Team Axe Chuck. The scene cuts to Governor Dunlop and Axe's meeting at Rouse four days earlier, when the exchanges that were opportunistically omitted from last week's episode are shown, just as I had intended. After Prince revealed his real autocratic tendencies at the Owl, she gave Axe the assurance that she could never join Prince's ticket. Additionally, Axe assures her that if she follows through on his plan, Prince would never become president. All she had to do was pose as Prince's Veep in order for Axe and Chuck to perform their Prince to Popper magic. Governor Dunlop is once again running for president, and she's bringing her supporters with her. Sorry, Mike. Bradford Luke, who was among the few players not on Team Axe, is another example of how the domino effect keeps happening. Chuck quickly heads out the door as Prince hysterically exclaims, I'm still a viable candidate. Bradford, however, is correct. Mike Prince's platform is as solid as a house of cards if he is no longer a self-made billionaire. Bradford will fortunately not be unemployed for very long. When he informed Governor Dunlop about Bradford's political acumen, since the theme of this episode is that it's better to have friends than enemies. However, Prince's nightmare keeps growing worse. When Axe flips on the TV, he sees Chuck speaking at a press conference regarding the natural gas industry collusion probe. Case closed, it turns out that the collusion was only a vicious rumor. This implies that any position that MPC sold off will appreciate exponentially. Subsequently, Scooter, Prince's longtime right-hand man, deepens the cut by saying that Prince will have to re-establish his wealth on his own. At last, Scooter can start suffering and conduct that symphony, to quote the legendary Cosmo Brown. Thankfully, Scooter won't have to suffer as much as he had anticipated due to the pay reduction that comes with being a conductor. Even though Philip betrayed Prince, Scooter will always be a member of his family. He emptied Prince's bank account while safeguarding his uncles, leaving Scooter with roughly $100 million and the adorably nicknamed Maestro. Chuck stops over at his father's Fifth Avenue apartment in the midst of the chaos since, of course, Senior had a hand in his son's biggest game. It turns out that the stories about the natural gas corporations were leaked to the media by dear old dad. However, that isn't the reason this sequence is the highlight of the show. I'm crying over one of the worst characters on television lately, that's a rare accomplishment. I must therefore express my sincere gratitude to Koppelman and Levian for crafting such a flawless moment, as well as to Jeffrey DeMunn for evoking strong emotions in me while retaining just a bit of Senior's disgusting personality, comparing Chuck to Phil Spector, Titical senior. My heart literally shot up when the second demon tells Paul Chimati, You did great, his voice quivering on the word great. That's what Chuck and the Billions audience had been waiting seven seasons to hear. Even though it took 50 years, Senior is finally proud of his son. Chuck's bad posture was pointed up by Senior, and the hug that followed was the icing on the cake for an amazing TV moment. Axe gives his opponent a comforting gift as the miserable prince, back at the wreckage of the former MPC, prepares to leave. The $100 million the prince had been instructed by Killer Mike to deposit in many banks owned by Black. That's like being a billionaire in Indiana, Axe sneers, reminding Prince that he had done the same exact thing to him two seasons prior. With this unexpected fortune, Prince, being the narcissist that he is, can only envision a fresh start. He issues a grave warning about America's foundation of second acts as he departs. The most genuine remarks the man has ever made. He'll start afresh, since he is the same as Chuck or Axe. For these individuals, the game never ends. It's fortunate that Prince left the building at the time he did, because he wasn't particularly interested in staying for Axe's magnum office. Axe made sure that everyone on his staff amassed absurd wealth, while Prince's billions were being taken away. As it turns out, Axe's mantra from last week's show, like it, no love it, was a yawn because he felt that simply making Prince a pauper was enough. However, that would be a project he could really get his teeth into if he could accomplish that while making Victor Dollar Bill, Tuck Law, 
Ben Kim, and the rest of his devoted staff extremely wealthy through stowing money away in a covered fund called the Admiral's Fund. If the scene in Admiral's Fund with Chuck and Sr. is the finest, then Chuck and Axe's farewell is a very close second. In addition to being absurd, it's also sincere and deeply felt. Jokes about aging exist. Mutual respect is being discussed. There's a parallel with blind faith. They both realize they probably won't be able to collaborate again. Even though they will probably run into each other occasionally, Axe gives Chuck back the hard disk that has the evidence in exchange for Chuck allowing him to indulge in certain future indulgences. They then talk about how neither of the guys has changed since they first met, just before they all go back to what they were doing before Billions started. Beneath the raw alpha male energy, Axe's reunion with the band has a melancholic undertone, even as he takes back his old office and gives his team orders to make some money. Was it Axe who went away, worked on himself, and adopted a new perspective, just to return and repeat the same actions over and over again? Wags is eager to travel and explore new things, maybe down in Miami. Is that possibly a sign of future spin-offs? However, Axe Global will differ from Axe Capital in that two key players in the former success are going it alone with Axe Global. Wendy and Taylor receive the hard sell from Axe, but neither of them is persuaded. The fact that this Axe lets Wendy and Taylor leave with Grace is the only solace. He goes so far as to offer Taylor the former Axe Global office for a charity. One final present is waiting for them when they get to the deserted location, a sign that reads the Taylor Mason Foundation and has the well-known TM emblem. Wendy is staying on as CEO of Mental because she views it as a fresh challenge, something she was never able to obtain at Axe Global, where they essentially wanted her to return and resume her more than two decades of employment in the same capacity. Nonetheless, something between Axe and Wendy is at least possible, something healthy, something unrelated to the workplace. After seven seasons, Billions finally realized that work doesn't have to take up all of your time. Nothing could capture that feeling more vividly than our previous glimpse of Chuck and Wendy. At last, both of them, well, Wendy at least, feel content with their life. As a result, they are able to have a family meal at a nearby hibachi restaurant, where Chef Brian Connerty is serving up service with a smile during what we can only hope is his final shift. Thank you, Billions, for the most amazing ride. You'll be missed. What a waste of my notion that Dr. Mayer was covertly collaborating with Prince or Axie. However, I think she would be a fantastic Wendy substitute at Axe Global.